Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and it looks like we have some new updates about Jupiter and about its moons. Actually, it's mostly about the moons, not so much about Jupiter. With these updates mostly focusing on new images, but also potentially explaining a very important mystery of how magnetosphere seems to operate around Ganymede. And that by itself is already a really important discovery. And so let's discuss these updates in more detail, and let's start with the object behind me. Io. Right before the end of 2023, NASA's Juno probe conducted the closest ever flyby of Io, taking the highest resolution pictures ever. This is one of them. Revealing Io in a way we've never really seen it before. Gorgeous colors, unusual patterns, and all of this a result of super active volcanoes on its surface. As you might already know, this is the most volcanic moon in the entire solar system, with over 150 active volcanoes on the surface and 400 in total. And though a lot of previous images sort of make it look like this, these new super accurate images present us with a lot of detail we've never seen before. As a matter of fact, this image right here was probably the most surprising. This was actually a highly enhanced image, but as you can see right there, it shows us volcanic vapors escaping from inside the moon. And since the moon is about 3600 kilometers across, these are enormous emissions, basically over 100 kilometers in height. So this by itself is already really impressive. But what's even more impressive is a recent discovery by an amateur astronomer, Jasper Sandberg, who analyzed one of the older pictures of Io and discovered something nobody has ever seen before. He was actually looking at the picture taken by Galileo probe back in 2001 and completely by accident discovered something very close to this very unusual canyon you see right here. He basically discovered a previously unknown small impact crater approximately 100 meters across, and it seems to have ejected around it, and so this could be a relatively recent impact. Now because this is a volcanic moon, most of the surface here usually gets reshuffled very quickly, so you don't really get to see a lot of impact craters as a result. And so discovering at least one is sort of exciting. But a much more exciting discovery is actually a result of an experiment that tried to understand and explain the magnetosphere of Ganymede. Ganymede, that's only a little bit larger than our own moon, contains a surprisingly powerful magnetosphere for an object of its size. It even contains aurora that we discussed in one of the previous videos. But it's not the same as the Earth magnetosphere, and it's a lot more hectic, a lot more distorted, and contains a lot of features we still don't understand. And more importantly, up until recently, it wasn't actually clear how exactly it's generated. Because of its unusual shape, it seems to be a result of something a little bit different from what happens inside planet Earth. And we know that for our own planet, it's most likely the result of extremely active dynamo or motion of liquid metal inside the outer core that sort of churns around and produces various magnetic loops that combine together to create a much larger field. But what exactly happens here? Well, first of all, we know that all of these moons experience a huge amount of squeezing and stretching from Jupiter and their partners. So they definitely contain a lot of heat on the inside. But what exactly this does to the internal structure of the moon is of course unclear. But the researchers behind the study you can find in a description had a very intriguing proposition that they decided to prove by using an experiment with water. They essentially believe that it's a result of a phenomenon known as crystallization of iron snow. Or for the lack of better words, it seems to snow iron inside the moon with the motion itself then generating unusual patterns that create magnetic fields or magnetic loops. And their experiment seems to prove this really well. So here's what they actually did. Here they took a tank of water that was being cooled from below and added a layer of salty water or brine water that rested on the bottom with a layer of normal non-salty water on top. And this sort of imitated two different densities and two different properties that we usually find inside various moons as well. But in this case, water sort of mimicked iron. But because of the heat interaction and because of the cooling and warming, they started to observe a lot of motion going up and down. But unlike a typical lava lamp, they started to observe the formation of tiny snowflakes that started moving away from the salty liquid upwards. And so in their experiment, they observed a kind of an unusual motion of upward snow that moved across different layers of water. This was a result of formation of ice crystals inside the tank, which basically formed right at the level between the salty and fresh water. And this could then be interpreted in a similar way inside the moon, except that it was basically 
upside down. Here it was very likely that the snow was moving downwards toward the core, floating backwards again once it's melted. And so what the scientists suggest here is that some kind of an unusual motion, circular motion, is generated by these snowflakes as a lot of liquid iron crystallizes inside the moon and starts to form this motion all across the surface. And this dynamo then generates magnetic fields. But one of the surprising findings here was that it does not seem to be constant and doesn't seem to have the same rate at all times. As a matter of fact, it seems to accumulate until a certain trigger point and then all happens pretty much at once with a lot of periods of inactivity in between. And this is a super important discovery because it can potentially explain why we seem to observe very sporadic activity around Ganymede as well and why the magnetosphere seems to have an unusual shape compared to planet Earth. More importantly, it sort of implies that the magnetic field is localized at different regions depending on the time. Sometimes the snowfall might occur in one location, other times it's going to occur in a different location resulting in a major shift of the magnetic field over time. But I guess more importantly, this also very likely applies to a lot of other moons and even Mercury. Many smaller objects very likely contain similar properties inside, and objects like Mercury also contains an unusual magnetosphere as well. And so this particular experiment potentially presents us with a very good explanation. And for all we know, this is maybe also something that used to happen on Mars and might even still happen on Mars to some extent and technically anything that contains a large enough metal core. So yeah, a super interesting discovery and a super interesting experiment. And combined with previous discoveries about Ganymede from last year that you can learn more about in the description below, all of this completely transforms our understanding of Ganymede and what seems to happen on its surface and also inside of it. Then once again we had a few observations from Europa and here it was finally confirmed that there is carbon dioxide on the surface with the James Webb Space Telescope confirming that the source is underground oceans. And this was actually proven because most of it seems to be located in Tara Regio, a location with a lot of chaotic terrain that contains a lot of emissions from underneath. And that mixed with the discovery of various salts in this location sort of points at super intriguing chemistry going on inside the moon. And it would actually be very difficult to explain CO2 and all of these salts without the presence of something really intriguing inside and potentially life. We know a lot of these minerals and salts along with CO2 is what a lot of bacteria on Earth also produce. This is usually a type of a biosignature here. And so at the moment this is a really intriguing sign that there might be life on Europa or technically inside Europa after all. But all of it hidden inside the ocean underneath. And though this is not 100% certain and the CO2 here could have actually come from maybe some kind of a chemical reaction we don't understand, luckily this year we also are getting a new mission, Europa Clipper. A mission whose goal is to find out what's leaking from within Europa and if any of these elements are truly signs of life or maybe something else. This mission is going to be launched in October of 2024, but it will take a few years before we get first results. And then last but not least, we also get new images of Jupiter itself, this time taken by the Hubble Space Telescope and taken in the UV, showing us Jupiter in ultraviolet light. And it definitely looks very different. Here whatever is darker basically absorbs UV light and as you can see the great red spot seems to absorb the most. And this is actually caused by a lot of different hazes and a lot of different aerosols that seem to be generally associated with extremely large storms inside gas giants. You can also see that there are some of these aerosols in a few of Jupiter's stripes, but also quite a lot of them in the polar regions. And though by itself this image is obviously kind of interesting, the main reason this was taken is to try to map water clouds inside Jupiter's atmosphere. This is actually going to allow scientists to create a kind of a three-dimensional picture of water clouds on the planet. And here's what this image would look like if you were to combine it with normal optical light. Actually this is also mixed with the infrared light, the image from the James Webb. And so if somehow our eyes could see infrared, UV light and of course optical light, this is what Jupiter would possibly look like. Absolutely gorgeous. Definitely incomparable to the regular image of the optical light. But once again we're missing one object, Callisto. Still nothing from Callisto. Why not? It's been like a year now and we haven't heard anything, no pictures, no discoveries, pretty much nothing. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly why Callisto has been ignored for so long now, but hopefully, maybe sometimes in the next few months, we'll hear a little bit more about this fourth Galilean moon, discovering more about it and potentially solving its mysteries as well. 
And so hopefully in the next few months, we'll come back and talk more about this once there are some discoveries about Callisto as well. On that note, check out some of the other recent discoveries in some of the videos in the description. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining general membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.